This week, female soldiers marched one step closer to equality in the military. On Monday, the Defense Department made good on an announcement from earlier this year to open the doors for women to join units previously populated only by men. The new policy is first getting a trial run by nine Army brigades before being expanded Army-wide. Where once women only worked alongside combat units, now they will be assigned to jobs within combat battalions, which means 14,000 new jobs now open to women. That still leaves them shut out of 250,000 jobs that remain closed. Now, that's a lot of missed opportunity for the 207,308 women currently serving on active duty, who make up 14.5% of the U.S. armed forces. Now, of those brave soldiers, only two, two women in military history have ever been awarded the title of four-star general, the highest appointment for an officer in three armed services. These remarkable women are Army General Ann E. Dunwoody and Air Force Lieutenant General Janet C. Wolfenbarger, who, by the way, are excluded from combat roles. You see, the usual path to, that's the, the usual path to reaching the four-star rank in the military. And that's because, while the new policy puts women closer to combat, the military's ground combat exclusion policy means zero women are allowed to formally risk their lives in combat shoulder to shoulder with their male counterparts. That's the case on paper anyway. The reality on the ground is that military women have long been on the front lines of combat and they've been facing some of the same dangers as their male peers. Because of the 282,000 American women deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan during the last decade of the war, 144 of them have died in Iraq and Afghanistan and 868 of them have been injured. They are among the 1.8 million American women veterans. And those numbers will only increase as the drawdown in Iraq and Afghanistan bring more service members back from overseas. Coming home to a 140 percent increase in female veterans identified as homeless by the VA between 2006 and 2010. Compare that to a 45 percent increase in homeless male veterans during the same period. Now, I want you to think about the number three. Because not only does the suicide rate for female soldiers triple when they go to war, but female veterans are three times as likely as civilian women to commit suicide when they come home. And because they don't receive any formal recognition for their roles in combat, those women who get lost in the fog of war have a harder time accessing the disability benefits that could help them find their way out. But all of that might be changing very soon, and we're going to tell you why coming up next. Monday's announcement on expanded roles for women in the military will give them more opportunities for service, but not necessarily the kind that matters most to earn admission into the highest, most elite ranks of the armed services. For that, women have to risk their lives and fight right alongside men on the front lines. They may soon have the opportunity. Democratic New York Senator Kristen Gillibrand and California Democratic Congresswoman Loretta Sanchez are introducing legislation into both chambers of Congress that would encourage the Pentagon to lift all restrictions on women in combat. And my guests today say that can't happen soon enough. Joining me is Kayla Williams, Iraq War veteran and fellow at the Truman National Security Project and the author of Love My Rifle More Than You, Young and Female in the U.S. Army. Also, Genevieve Chase, who served in Afghanistan and received a Purple Heart and runs American Women Veterans. Still with us, Salamisha Tillett, Assistant Professor of English and Africana Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. And in D.C., Kimberly Dozer. AP intelligence and counterterrorism writer and former CBS News Baghdad correspondent. Thanks to all of you for being here. Yeah, thank you. So, Kim, I actually want to start with you and, and bring you in since you're, since you're there in D.C. G- can you talk to me how significant a step are the recent changes in terms of opening up new roles for women? Well, the great thing is it acknowledges the women who are already on the ground doing some of these jobs. I- on the ground in Iraq and Afghanistan. They might not have had the official assignments, but because of the way the battle lines change, um, just driving across the country puts you in the middle of a war zone. Uh, The other thing is, um, when I look around at my colleagues, uh, diplomats, journalists, a good quarter to a third of the people around me in war zones are women. It seems like the U.S. military is finally catching up to that. Now, what this will mean in practice, tearing down some of those um, internal divisions, there are still some uh, folks in command out there who need to be taught about what we can do. 
Yeah, so I, I, I love that comparison, Kim, because, you know, obviously women are right there on the front lines, not only as soldiers, but obviously embedded with our troops. And yet, Genevieve and, and Kayla, it feels like the Pentagon is behind the curve in simply recognizing that women are already there. So both of you have been very near to combat. What, is, what does that mean to say that you were near to combat since you weren't officially in combat? Well, I think that it is a little confusing for people outside the system to understand the difference. Women aren't banned from combat. Okay. They're banned from combat jobs and from mm -hmm. being assigned to combat units at certain levels. But as you pointed out, over 140 women have died in combat, so clearly they're in combat. And women have earned the Silver Star for their valor in combat in both Iraq and Afghanistan. We were performing in those roles, though, by being attached to certain units uh, instead of assigned to them in some situations, or as, as Kim mentioned, by the fact that there are no front lines. This is no longer World War I. Right. And, and the, entire, uh, the entire theater of operations can be considered a combat zone. So it's a, it's a little different. We haven't been banned from combat, though, just from certain roles and positions. But, but that banning from, from the assignment, from the roles and positions, has a critically important effect on the career path. Is that correct? Uh, it absolutely can have an impact on that. Um, but the people who have sort of served with us over the last decade recognize the capacity with which we've served. Mm -hmm. And despite what is on the books, you know, they're able to see our contribution and to respect that as well. And that's why the laws and the rules are being changed now to be updated um, to, to demonstrate what we've already done. We essentially had to go and do it. And, and mm -hmm. unfortunately, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, this is a, a positive that came out of that, was we were able to go out there and test ourselves, improve ourselves, and now we need to catch up the policies to reflect what we've already done. Right, because these are very protracted wars, and wars where we, were, where we were using a completely volunteer army, right? No, right? no draft in this case. And so that meant lots of deployments and simply not enough not enough bodies, not enough folks. So when I, when I listen to Kayla say that women are attached but not assigned, that sounds to me as though the Pentagon is sort of reproducing this version of gender roles that is at least 30 or 40 or maybe 100 years old in how we think about everything from our politics to our, to our economic life. Yeah, so I think it's so important and the social and political implications of fully desegregating um, the, the military is, is far-reaching, right? So if you have women who actually are fully incorporated into all levels of the military, you can't then justify that women shouldn't deserve equal pay. Mm -hmm. You can't then justify that women shouldn't have control over their, their bodies, right? Um, so the biological and the psychological arguments that are used to sort of say that women shouldn't be fully integrated, we saw this with African American men in, yeah. in, in World War II, and, and you, those arguments can't sustain themselves anymore. I mean, people can kind of use them still, but once you actually fully desegregate the military, I think it's kind of the final frontier for certain kinds of versions of discrimination. So I think it's so important um, to, to, for this to happen now. Right, and we don't actually have anyone from the Pentagon here, so I wanted to look at a, at a quick statement from the Pentagon and this Pentagon report to the Congress about women's restrictions, because they're still making some, some clear claims about women's restrictions. Um, and, and, and so what they've said here is that women um, basically uh, need to be held to um, the same standards physically. So they are saying that there are some serious practical barriers which require time to resolve so the department can maximize their safety and privacy. So, you know, so that's what we're hearing, that it's a safety and privacy issue, and these practical issues feel to me like they're at least in part sort of concerns about physical capacity. Or, you know, you, you, again, you've both been there. Is, is that a legitimate kind of concern? I think that it can be a legitimate concern, but the assumption that it's only a legitimate concern for females is misguided. Oh, I see. So, for example, if there are jobs units or missions that require somebody to be able to carry a 50 pound rucksack for 20 miles yeah. then fine make sure that everybody can do it males and females a man who's 5 foot 2 and weighs 110 pounds could be very challenged by that whereas a woman who's 5'10 and weighs 180 may not find that as challenging i'm completely supportive of having uniform physical fitness standards for those those jobs, units, or missions that require them. Right, but they have to be for everyone. Kim, I, l let me ask you um, about this, because, you know, is the Pentagon sort of evolving on this? Are we seeing a slow movement towards what is clearly going to be um, equality, or is there some real possibility here um, that, that these sorts of double standards are going to stay in place? Well, I would say there are two things going on. We are evolving towards the point that um, the commanders will accept if the individual can do the job, no matter man, woman, uh, 
sexual orientation Eight. that they belong in the unit. That person also has to prove to that unit that everyone in it can trust them to fight their way out. That's one battle that will happen in the front lines and also in the Pentagon. The other thing that's happening, though, with war is it's evolving towards away from combat in that we're drawing down in Iraq and Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. We're going to a war that's much more intelligence based, yeah. has a lot more to do with infiltrating society with what look like couples. Mm -hmm. Women will prove their worth by being valuable in those roles. That's a really interesting point that as war changes, the idea of what a soldier needs to have in terms of a skill set will dramatically change. Right? This is not trench warfare right. and you can't determine how far you are from the front lines because there's not a front line in the same right. way. And I think that in um, looking at the new battle space front, mm -hmm. What they're talking about, essentially, and what we, is the phrase that everybody has sort of come up with is counterinsurgency. Um, you know, especially the hearts and minds, when you start talking about getting into societies and getting into cultures and understanding that, we have a natural capacity to be able to go and talk to women, to be able to appeal to the other side of the culture. And, and to be perfectly honest, even in a non-permissive environment like Afghanistan, I talk to many men in the local communities. So, you know, we have a lot of strengths. We have a lot of things to offer beyond just the physical aspect of it. So, and that's something that many commanders are beginning to recognize. Genevieve's absolutely right. And I think it's important to remember that in especially Muslim countries, mm. women in counterinsurgency operations can play a vital role. We can access that half of the population that it would be much more challenging for our male comrades to have access to. So I want to I want to talk about the challenges not only that you're facing in the, the question of combat but sort of as women come home and particularly um, both uh, issues of um, post-traumatic stress disorder. I want to talk a little bit about um, issues of sexual assault and violence and then of course about homelessness and unemployment and all of those questions. So we're going to turn to all of the issues of kind of how, how war continues to have an impact on women veterans as we come back. We're here and talking about women at war and the new Pentagon policy formally allowing them into combat units. Kim, let me ask you this. Sexual assault in the military, we're talking about an estimated 19,000 women um, sexually assaulted in the military. If if we're looking at more women in more equal combat roles, is that likely to reduce or increase? Will it have any impact? Is, is sexual assault just kind of a, a separate issue here? It just feels to me like we want this to be on our agenda at the same time. You know, that's always going to be an issue. You have a population of men and women together. It's going to be an issue. Um, when you're trying to change a policy and change some minds, could there be an increased... Um, number of um, assaults, harassment, sure. But look, everyone going into these jobs, um, jobs overseas, whether it's intelligence, diplomacy, journalism, or troops, you know that you're going to be challenging some gender roles, especially challenging them overseas, yeah. where they really haven't caught up with us. And you're going to run into this. This is just kind of, you have to put the armor on because you know that's what you're going to face. You're it's it's just part of the background noise. So that's certainly not a reason to um, not leave my house in the morning. Yeah. I'd like to bring up that military sexual trauma, sexual assault within the military, is not exclusively a female problem. Uh, uh, we think of it as being a woman's issue, but in terms of those who report to VA that they experience military sexual trauma, although women report in a much higher percentage, because we're such a minority within the military, the raw numbers of men and women reporting are roughly similar. This is not exclusively a female problem, and I think that the stigma that women face in reporting, the difference between the mm -hmm. projected number, estimated numbers and the numbers who report, I think men face an even bigger challenge in coming forward and reporting that they've experienced sexual assault because the, the stigma is so great for I think for it them. has to be higher for men. And I disagree a little bit with Kim. I believe that if we remove the combat exclusion policy completely, that over the long term it will serve to reduce yeah. instances of sexual harassment. I think that... Because there will be a sense of equality could, that we're all yes. in this together. It's, it's my opinion that having the combat exclusion policy, it institutionalizes... A concept of women as second-class citizens, of not real soldiers. Oh, you, you don't quite deserve to be here. You don't have to pass the same physical fitness test. You can't be in the combat arms. And that if we remove that policy mm -hmm. and women are, are finally acknowledged as being full 
soldiers and, and institutionally considered equal, that over the long run it will serve to make the climate better and less permissive. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really important point, and it, it kind of pushes back against this idea of, well, we have to protect you, right? And so we can't let you in combat because you have to be protected. You know, it, it also feels to me, fellow major, like in, in all the battles for the ERA, in all the battles for the Equal Rights Amendment and the idea of sort of instantiating in our Constitution that women are equal citizens, that this issue of women in combat was constantly used as the scare tactic to, to sort of build political will against the ERA. Once we have women fully in combat, is that, is that the end of the sort of final boogeyman? Is there, a, is there an ERA on the backside of this? Well, I hope so. But, yeah. you know, as I said, this diminishes um, some of the arguments about biology and psychology that have used to discriminate against women. It won't eradicate them fully. Um, but I want to add in this conversation about sexual violence um, and whether it's background noise or not, I think I agree with you that it's not only a form of second class citizenship, but it's used to maintain women in, in inferior right. positions. But I also think and there's this great documentary out now called The Invisible War about sexual assault mm -hmm. in the military. And I think if we could change the culture and thinking about sexual assault as a national security issue, you, right. Yes. I mean, that's the, the, if we can change it and think about it as something that puts women and men at harm who are serving yeah. for us, and then the, the effects both while they're there or and when they come home. I mean, if we can reimagine it differently, I think it goes a long way in thinking about. When you harm sexual the soldier, you're, you're harming the nation. The, the nation. It's not just. It would be a radical, yeah. re, you know, reconfiguring how we think about sexual assault. But I think that's really what's happening. So. And Genevieve, you work with veterans. So, so what are women facing as as they come home? And there will be more and more coming home, as, as uh, Kim just pointed out, we're drawing down now. Right. Uh, there are a number of issues. I was on the phone for a great deal of time yesterday and have been over the last couple of weeks with a couple of different women who um, are trying to transition out of the military. And we're starting to see things and hear things that are just extremely disturbing. Um, things from, you know, having been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress mm -hmm. and combat stress, having been treated for that for, you know, half a year, and then having that diagnosis changed to adjustment disorder which is an immediate sort of discharge, just get them off of active duty as quickly as possible, um, into the VA healthcare system where they then have to take whatever they have left and fight that battle to get their claims processed and to get treatment and to get care. So um, I know that there's been some recent stuff in the press lately, and uh, whenever I hear that stuff, I always think, not in my military. Mm -hmm. And then I get these calls and I have to talk to these women and work with them on these things. Um, and it's just overwhelming. But in terms of things like, well, I wanted to comment a little bit on the military sexual trauma aspect. Sure. Um, I don't think we do enough to psychologically and emotionally prepare uh, people for these types of things. I think that resiliency and, and that type of training and understanding starts early. I think we, just like in universities and, and other places, other parts of our society and our culture, we don't necessarily do an adequate job of preparing young women or young people, men as well, um, for the things that they might face out there. So we have young women coming into the military. I mean, I had an, a 19-year-old girl who went to all, an all-girl Catholic school. Yeah. I mean, she, did, she wasn't as wise in the ways of, of that type of military culture. Um, so we, we, there's so much we can do on the front end as well that I think should be preventative. And um, we stopped having these very uncomfortable discussions with our children yeah. in our culture. Um, I think in some ways we still carry that on. And in terms, in respect to the higher reporting rates, we want to see that. Yeah. Um, we want to see more people feeling comfortable and confident enough to come forward knowing that they're going to be taken care of. And that transfers over to when they get out and when they come home. If they feel like they can't openly talk about things because they're going to be judged, their careers are going to be impacted, or they're not going to receive the care and treatment that they need, that's all that stuff spirals down into the suicide rate. So from recruits to soldiers to veterans, making sure that we're preparing and taking care at every point yes. because you all are doing the work of caring for our country. Genevieve, Kayla, Salamisha, and Kim, thank you all so much for being here. And coming up, 